problems, the audio. All right, good morning, everyone. It's um, 8.32 on Tuesday, March 22nd. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Canaan. And um, I'm on remotely. Kathleen Nicker in the town hall meeting room. And um, uh, before we start our agenda, we have two items to add to the agenda. I think you have them on your desks. Mm -hmm. um, I move we add the Elm Street bump outs and the sidewalk bricks um, to the agenda. Second? Second here. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, first item on the agenda is the minutes from the last meeting on March 8th, 2022. Any comments or corrections on the minutes? I shared my, um, there's a typo and I shared that with Pam already. So she has that. With that correction, I move we approve the minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Public comments. Um, members of the public are welcome to provide comments to the Board of Selectmen on agenda topics, schedule for review and or vote. Um, anyone here present in the uh, meeting room? No. Um, since, this is a, since this is a hybrid meeting, we will take comments by email as well, sent to bosdistribution at canisct.gov, um, and we'll read them um, in the course of or before the end of the meeting. So Pam will be watching for comments. Um, Next item on the agenda is the Director of Fire Services. Um, <coughs> I actually thought we did this already, but I guess not. Um, is Jack and- uh, Yes, they're all present. Everyone's present. Cheryl, good, good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So we would like to ask for approval to move uh, Al Bassey. He started as the Assistant Chief uh, in September of 21. Then he was moved to the interim chief of the fire department. And now we would like to move him to the chief of the fire department and director of fire services. Um, I think you have all worked closely with Albie over the past six months. Uh, he has been a tremendous asset to the town, to the fire department. And um, I am all in favor of seeing us promote him. And the fire uh, commission voted for this promotion unanimously. Fantastic. Great. Any questions for Cheryl or Jack? Just a comment. I think this will be the last time you're coming and getting that. <laughs> That's the wrong. You're, you've reached the top and uh, we're delighted. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, Albie. And uh, I'm very happy to move the request from you, Mr. Resources, to uh, remove Albie Bassett from probationary status and to approve the promotion uh, from interim chief to chief of the fire department and Director of Fire Services, effective March 20, 2022. I guess we're doing this retroactively. And yes. I am uh, delighted to second that motion, Alby. Congratulations. This is great. This is great. So um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations, Alby. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, vote of confidence and all the support I've gotten in the last six months. So from everybody, thanks. Terrific. Now you have the next item on the agenda. I get to spend more money. <laughs> so uh, uh, fire department is requesting 34,000 uh, for our station learning system, uh, 32,400 is for the bricks and then additional 1600 for additional CAD, CAD monitors in the firehouse uh, lighting and speakers as needed when they uh, install bricks is the, um, basically the tones in the firehouse uh, coming from our combined dispatch center in Fairfield now, uh, or soon to be, we're still out of Westport. Uh, when they tone the firehouse out, lights are going to go on. They're going to have ramp up tones uh, good for the uh, stress levels, the lower stress levels when the, the loud noises come in. So it's a more state of the art system than our current Z-Tron, which actually is no longer compatible with the new system moving forward. Um, so the request for the 34,000 to uh, start that project, it is funds that have been budgeted in capital uh, over the last, last year's uh, capital budget. 
So Albie, these, these tone, this new tone system is more user-friendly? Is that what you're saying? The, the tones themselves, the noise and the light, we do, currently we do not have lights that turn on in the firehouse at night uh, or during the day if it's uh, you know, in certain areas. Um, so the lights do turn on with LED lights turn on with the uh, tones coming in and the tones, what they say is they ramp up. So they start very quiet and start to slowly get louder instead of the the currently loud full noise jump out of your chair when the tones go off if if they don't give you uh the Without warning the that yeah if they don't give you a warning a call's coming in and then all of a sudden the, the tones come out and uh yeah you're jumping out of your skin when that happens sometimes uh so that's the uh the new uh style of tone over the last you know maybe a decade now that uh an fpa and uh, fire service has been um supporting uh for in-station alerting this system also um has a the cad monitors which tie into the software that uh firefighters both career and volunteer use on their phones also so that's the backup system that'll take the place of another um uh system that the volunteers are currently paying for so that's all it's all going to be tied together and will be two independent systems so you mentioned that we're moving from Westport to Fairfield in terms of dispatch. Cause I, on my phone, I get all the dispatches is Westport. It's moving to Fairfield. There are physical locations moving out of the uh, Westport headquarters to Sacred Heart university in a uh, state of the art system. You know, everything that a communication system is supposed to have um, multiple dispatchers, uh, call taker dispatchers that are going to um, do both Fairfield and Westport and New Canaan fire out of there. So we're going to have a backup people and so on as they rotate through the positions. That's good. Thank you, Chief. Uh, just a, a quick question. So the package itself, the installation, I understand, the package itself is on a two-year contract. So how much of that do you think will be renewed? Is that like a uh, two-year contract of the $32,000? The only renewable thing is that yearly service maintenance contract and that's ne negotiable with them whether we keep that but that's their the, the bricks is a proprietary system so they do have software upgrades um that they they push out and that's what the uh, 2500 dollars is for the service agreement so that would be the only renewable uh they do have a warranty on their um on their alert package the actual device that takes in the call Everything else we could, the nice thing about this, it was vetted by a Westport uh, assistant chief who's into the uh, communication system. Anything else you want to add to the system, whether it's lighting or speakers, in theory, we can do it ourselves. So after the initial uh, installation cost, uh, we can add those to the system at minimal cost buying the, um, the approved product that they you can get at Home Depot. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No further questions. I move we approve this request from the fire department to enter into a contract with Brick Station Alerting Systems as described by Albi for a total project cost of $34,000. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you, Albi. Thank you, uh, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Great day. Feel better, sir. Thank you. Tiger is up. Um, and, and Tiger, why don't you add the Elm Street bump outs and the sidewalk bricks to your next five, four or five items. Okay, all right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so uh, the first item was, actually they're all kind of combined into one as Kevin just mentioned. So we have a, a material purchase for granite and then you added, thankfully, um, thank you for um, uh, material purchase for brick and then the actual work uh, for the bump outs on Elm Street. So I'll attack the uh, materials for granite purchase first. We went out, we received uh, two quotes from the two the companies that we worked with in the past, William Stone in North Carolina Granite. Uh, William Stone came in at $18,043.12. This is for uh, granted for not only the Elm Street bump outs, but also for other projects, sidewalk projects that we have in town. We also provide granite to developers that are developing properties in town so that they'll use the higher end material for us. So we provide the material, they provide the labor. 
Um, so it's been working out quite well for us. Um, it was instituted with the previous planner, Steve Kleppen, and it's the, the process has worked quite well. Um, the interesting note, if you wanted to talk about uh, materials and what's been happening last year in November, um, North Carolina Granite was selling us granite at $18, $19 a foot. Now their quotes are $22.20, right? William Stone is at $22.10. If you went across the board for both of them, then they were within dollars of each other, except for the fact that North Carolina Granite, in order to get their material here to us, was going to charge us $3,750 a truckload because mm -hmm. it's coming from North Carolina and it's very mm -hmm. difficult to get someone to come up here. Whereas last year it was $300 a truckload. So <clears throat> with that said, um, we'd like to go forward with the purchase of granite from William Stone at $18,043 and 12 cents. And the monies are currently available on our budget. Do you want me to go to the other two as well and do them all? Or you want to do them individually, Kevin? Go ahead. Okay. The, uh, so the next one is, purchasing uh, materials for uh, the brick sidewalks themselves, the brick itself. Um, and again, we went to two contractors or two suppliers, Paramount Stone and Homer C. Godfrey. The problem with Homer C. Godfrey is the fact that they weren't, weren't going to be able to deliver the materials to us until July 21st was the first date. So four months from now, whereas Paramount Stone was going to be able to get, get us the first delivery, half of the delivery now and half of the delivery in a little bit. And we need, Basically, half the material now we have some in stock, and then we can replenish what we have, and then provide the rest to the to the um, other builders in town. So we'd like to go forward with uh, the purchase of stone uh, brick from Paramount Stone for fourteen thousand six eighty four sixteen. Their price from last year is slightly elevated, not not the uh, not the what we saw from the granite, but slightly elevated from last year it was just around five dollars a square foot. Now we're at five point seven four cents per square foot. So it's a, up a little bit from last year, but nothing out of the ordinary. And then the, the last one on this to uh, bring it together is that we uh, went out and received a quote from Peter Lonnie Associates to put in the bump outs on Elm Street, just on the Northern side. It's about 270 feet long. It'll be granite the entire purchase away with brick inlay. Um, they were uh, part of a low bid for our paving 2020 contract where we had sidewalks installed in there, granite and brick sidewalks installed in there. They were the low bid price at that point in time. And they said that they would hold their price from 2020 going forward. So um, we feel that they're the, the best contractor to do this work, given the sensitivity of the area, the fact that they're flexible and can work around the restaurants and the other um, merchants that are in the area. And we like to go forward with that work. That's a, that price was at $52,020. We put a 15% contingency of 7,800 on it for a total of $59,820. And does that include the materials? Uh... No, the, the materials are supplied by us. That's, right, so... that's standard. Right, okay. So the, Question about brick those... and granite, the brick and granite that we just requested will be part of this project. <clears throat> and, the, and the existing curbing is gonna remain where it is. We're gonna bump out and put an additional uh, additional granite curbing at the edge now. Correct, yeah, we, the, uh, to try to take the existing granite out would be uh, very problematic and very disruptive. So the feeling is we'll leave it in place and then build out from there, use that as a shelf to build out from there for the, for the remaining work. But the bump out itself would be level, level with the sidewalk. Correct, it'll just be curb. like the sidewalk just got extended out. It'll just have a piece of granite in the middle Ta of it. Tiger, can you give us a background of the need for this, the connection to outdoor dining, how many spots are we gonna lose parking wise, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, the, uh, so this went to the police commission for approval last year. Uh, we had um, Planet Conservation Development H-24 review uh, by, by planning and zoning last year. So this is uh, in conjunction with trying to increase pedestrian safety in the area, shorten the, the, uh, the travel distances across the street specifically in front of the playhouse and at South Avenue, where we've got a kind of a crossing there, um, a little bit of a difficult intersection with a lot of pedestrian traffic. So this will bring out the, the sidewalk eight feet. So it'll be uh, the parallel parking lane will be removed in this location from South Avenue to the playhouse. What we have in that area as well is we have a lot of people parking in those spots. Um, once we 
striped them with hash marks because we can't be within 25 feet of a crosswalk by state law. We striped them with hash marks, but we're still getting people parking in there. And now they're actually parking over the top of the crosswalk, blocking the pedestrian ramps. Um, we're getting a lot of abuse in the area and a lot of difficulty trying to manage it. So the feeling is that if we just hard panned it, we necessarily <laughs> have all those, all those, those problems and those issues. Um, and then the subsequent part of that is that we reduce the pedestrian crossing distance, which increases safety, reduce speeds, probably a little bit speeds are quite low already on Elm street. And then we get the added benefit of allowing additional space for outdoor dining, which has been a success since we did forest street back in 07, 08. How, how big is the bump out? Eight feet wide. But how, how long? 270 feet. How long? 270 feet. Okay. So from basically. So from that's a big bump out. Right from the from the from the intersection of South Avenue to just west of the Playhouse, and that will preclude the need for um, barriers. Barriers. Yes, the barriers were basically a test. Thank you for, of the area. So that area that we had removed um, from parking or from the from right. the right of way line with the barricades, the barricade. We place the barricade, the outside of the barricade at that eight foot mark. The beautiful so plastic barricades, right? Beautiful plastic barricades, yes. <laughs> Waterfield. Yeah. So this will essentially replace the bump out, the 270 foot long bump out will replace the Correct. barrier. Right. And it'll bring us in line with the new state law, which requires that the pedestrian way be on the sidewalk versus we were having the pedestrian way travel into the right of way. So there's a new state law that came into effect last year that says that the pedestrian A has to remain on the sidewalk. So you can't take someone off. So what about restaurants east of? Uh, at that point in time, we, we wanted to see if there was a, if this was successful. And then at that point in time, we could look at restaurants east and west of this area. So I know that there's a request for the restaurants or the establishments east of the area. Um, west of the area seems to be doing well without it, but necessarily they might ask for that as well. But we wanted to see exactly how this would go. And then at that point in time, there's a commensurate drop in parking spaces as well that we would, every time we institute a bump out, we would be losing one or two spaces at that time. Yeah, on the north side of Elm Street, pretty much. <clears throat> right. You, you could, you know, you could take away all spots. Presumably. The original proposal was to do exactly that, take away the entire parking lane and just bump out the sidewalk by eight feet. We narrowed it down to uh, to this area to try to stay specifically in what we considered our pedestrian safety right. area. Right. Yeah, you know, and not necessarily an initiative for, for our outdoor dining. That so there has been a request from restaurants not, east specific, east. not specifically to, to me, but through others to me. Yes, we've heard that they would like to have that, but that would have to go back to the police commission for review and, uh, and then a further analysis to determine whether or not we would do anything right. further. Right. So Tiger, if you can, so you, you supplied us with the, the uh, sort of aerial view here. If, if mm -hmm. I, as I look at this, so the, um, the crosswalk that comes from the eastern side of South Avenue going over towards the Playhouse, it looks like the bump out continues a little bit more to uh, the east. Is that right? Or is that so in front the, of Alban Pen? On the, uh, yeah, on the, are you talking in front of Le Pen? Le Pen, yeah. Le Pen, yeah. So the, the bump out will go from the Playhouse past Le Pen, past Elm, and then I, uh, the retail establishments, I, I don't have. Okay, no so right. it actually goes to the east of where South Avenue is. Right. It's just east of the South Avenue okay, entrance, gotcha. yeah, because we at that point in time we had 25 feet that we had to provide of a no parking area because of the crosswalk. So we're taking in that um, that 25 feet. Okay, I see that. Okay, great. Um, and then how many parking places did you say that takes away? At present, it was five. Five. Right. We have a we have a second phase that we that we we'd like to implement, which is actually on the southern side, whereby there are actually larger bulb outs. We want to see exactly how this this works, and we don't want to disrupt the uh, the area too much with construction. But the bulb outs on the on the other side will help us enhance the the not only the pedestrian safety, will enhance um, ADA accessibility, and then give us back the fire that we were losing. So it's a kind of a twofold process to take care of one side, then we'll take care of the other side. How does it give it back? Isn't it taking once we take away a couple? Once we 
hard pan it, we can actually move closer to the crosswalk because you can't drive. I see. You right. know, at that point okay. in time, right? You can't drive over the curb to get to it, right? So we can actually start to maximize the space that we're having um, in the areas. So we so based upon the amount that Maria did a very nice job on the analysis, looking at that, we actually gain the five back that we lose across okay. the street. And what's so, the timing on that? Hopefully, once we put this in, then we'll come back again later. We'll get a, we'll refresh the quotes in this area and then come forward with that. So I, I would hope to say that that might be midsummer, oh, you know, to come back and do that. Okay. I just want to see exactly how this plays out, sure. and see how everyone is, how it's working, before we decide to actually extend out into the right of way with the bulb out. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is he frozen? Oh, can't hear him. Kevin. You're on mute, Kev. I was saying no further questions. Let's move on these three items together um, as Tiger described. The, um, the materials for the uh, granite and the brick and then the uh, and then the Pugilani contract for the uh, work to be done on the bump outs. Um, I move we approve all three. Second. Second. Further discussion? On here. All favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Tiger. Thank you. Thank you Tiger. Now we go so, to street work. Right. Uh, actually, I have a uh, localized repairs is next. Oh, I'm sorry. Number six, localized repairs. The um, So this is a, an extension of a contract that we've had in place for a number of years with New England paving. We typically do this in two phases, uh, phase one, phase two, at $100,000 each. Uh, New England Paving has been doing excellent work for us since 2008. We went into this time and material contract with them uh, since 2011, and it's worked out quite well for us. We do a, an analysis every year as to how much um, work they're able to accomplish, how much it's costing us on a time and material basis, and then break that back down into a square foot basis to see whether or not we're still in line with other bids that are out um, in the area other towns um, and other work that we're doing. And each year it comes in that this is probably the best way to do it because we, we can, he can go attack an area. If he goes and attacks an area and then gets delayed somewhere else, he can go somewhere else and work and then come back and work for us on a time material versus having remobilization charges or problems with downtime, things of that nature. And as long as we continue to um, provide him with work areas, the work flows quite well, um, quite smoothly and quite efficiently. So therefore it keeps our costs down. Not to mention the fact that he's probably the best contractor we've seen to do this type of work anywhere in the region. Um, other contractors that we've asked, when we say we want to do this work, they say, why don't you just hire New England Pavement because they're better. Uh, <laughs> so the feeling, and I think Moses here too, I think you can speak to it as well, that, that it's, been a, it's been a program that we've had in place for a number of years and it works out exceptionally well for us for anything from curb repair, driveway repair, localized repairs, trench repair, anything that we have, larger areas that that are in um, that don't get to the point where you would pave, but you would need to repair because we're gonna come in and put a micro thin overlay on it or a cape seal, things of that nature where we're having distresses in a, in a local or small area pavement. We have them come in, take care of it, and then we're able to pave over the top of it. Um, and I, we did a test drive a number of years ago, whereby I closed my eyes on Silvermine Road and we drove Silvermine Road and I couldn't tell where the patches were and the road was for the entire distance. And he had probably done 12 or 13 patches, large scale patches on Silvermine and couldn't tell the difference between the two. So, and that's exactly what we want is that when, when we repair a utility trench, we repair an area that the phone call dies, right? The phone call stops. Cause that's what's generating the phone call is that resident driving over two, three times a day, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump. And then all of a sudden we get rid of it. And then the phone call goes away and rider satisfaction goes up, user satisfaction goes up. And that's exactly what we want. So yeah. this is in the PMP budget. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a part of that $250,000 that we have every year. That's part of it. So we'd like to continue with this contract, you know, this phase and we'll, we'll most likely come back for the second phase sometime in, the June, July range for the second half of the year. While we're at it. <laughs> sure. Can you talk about paving downtown? Um, sure. So the, uh, since it's, it's now spring. So it's now spring. They're, uh, they're working, uh, Aquarian and Eversource are working through their permits to come and do the downtown area. Um, so the moment that they're able to then come and do that, they'll take care <laughs> of that stretch of Cherry Street, which is 124 and Main Street, which is 124. So they'll take care of those two pieces. Um, and then, uh, 
once the asphalt plants open and everyone's rolling and work, the weather cooperates a little bit, we try to get a little bit more of the moisture out of the ground. Our contractors will go in and do Brinkerhoff, Mortimer, and Lockwood. We have a bid out right now for our work, um, our paving work that'll come back in on Thursday, uh, next Thursday. Um, so, uh, and then at that point in time, that'll take care of, out of our lowest 20 roads, 10 of the 20 roads will be done or 10 of the 20 road sections will be done. The other 10 actually have a, to be, you have either another project on top of it, like a water main going in or a gas main going in, or they will be later on in the season in that case. So we'll be taking care of the bottom 20 segments of our road network this year done. So we'll be actually complete with our entire program a year or so in advance of where we thought we would be. If Eversource hadn't come in, we probably would have been two or three years in advance, but well, it's fine. We're still ahead of the game. Um, and then lastly, once we see what the numbers come in for our paving, then I can estimate what's going to happen for Eversource. And then we're going to bid out Eversource's work. And that'll be for everything from, in essence, if you're looking at the areas that are bounded, Farm Road, Main Street, Park Street are three barriers. And then Oak Street being at the north, so your east, southwest, and north barriers, South Avenue being in the middle, anything on either side will be taken care of in that stretch on, on Eversource's dime at that point. So every road from Farm Road to Oak Street between Main and Park will be taken care of this year because that's our plan at that point in time then we have a little bit to go from oak to cherry and a couple and then park street itself at that point in time and that's that's slated for next year to try to give them that one extra year for people to to uh join up and uh sign on does that answer your question yeah thank okay. you You're tiger welcome. actually would you clarify park street because i'm because uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna do the sidewalks and the park street with the the state grant the sidewalks are with a state grant, correct. The paving itself is uh, on Eversource's dime. There was a 2019 road, so theoretically, it was uh, 19, 20, 21. We give them the 22 year because of COVID, it'd be 23. But if we can see that we're, if, if the majority of people, um, if the saturation rate is high, the majority of people have signed on, then we can necessarily piggyback that on the existing contract and have Park Street done prior. I mean, so it's conceivable we, we could do Park Street uh, by the fall it is correct yeah I mean, that would be very desirable to get that done. it would be helpful because then we would have main street and park street done and both sides and then south avenue is done so all three arteries would be uh would be taken care of so we should put an emphasis like we have in other roads to encourage people to hook up and uh like like you did with main street mm -hmm. we can do that I, I can like we can either go knock on doors or we can uh you know notify the residents that we'd like them to sign up earlier rather than later and then has the state indicated when they're going to pay 123 and 124 uh no that that the uh the vendor in place program that they have that the state has no they haven't given us a uh, a schedule so the state is also coming in and taking care of stretches of 123 basically um from 106 to the town line on on 123 um 124, the upper stretches of 124 to the town line, and then 106, there's some stretches as well. So they're doing about seven miles of road paving in town this year as well. So there's a there'll be a lot of material going down this year in town. So it should be um it should be a good year for us in that regard. You say 123 north to the town line. 123 north to the okay. town line. Okay. Yeah, 124 north to the town line, okay. just out of town, north to the town line, and then 106. Um, there's a stretch heading out of town towards the, towards the east. That they're taking care of they've already done on 106 they've already done the southern sections in 123 and 124 they've done the southern sections now it's the northern sections will be pretty much complete and how much is the cost of asphalt being affected by the we i don't have a i don't have a, a bid number yet i'm waiting that's the that's the anticipatory number right now we anticipate we know it's going to go up we just don't know to what extent so when the numbers come back in um later on uh, we'll, we'll know exactly what's happening. So that's, we're keeping our fingers crossed for Thursday. Good. All right. If there's no further questions, I move we approve the paved 2022 localized repairs project for $100,000 as Tiger described. Second here. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Then now we have tree work.
Oh, we have tree work. The uh, we sent this uh, bid out our March 17 bid to all um, seven contractors that we normally send it to. Um, unfortunately, we only received one price back from Olmstead Tree Care. They predominantly win the majority of our bids. They responded back with, a, um, according to Bob Horan, our tree warden, a very favorable bid. It's for eight separate sections or sec separate locations in town. Um, we have a couple of projects whereby we're taking down some trees for other projects. The uh, the work at the service area that we're, we're taking, um, that the Conservancy and the town are, are working on together. Um, there are three um, older trees being removed in that area and uh, that entire area be replanted. And then for um, some work at center school to redo the driveway, the entrance off of South Avenue, there are a couple of trees there. So there's a couple of projects that we're working that it's, some of the trees have to come down for that, but the majority of them are, are diseased and dying trees that need to come down. Any questions about this? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say the number eight Elmstead tree and shrub care for $18,620. I move or approve the request from the tree warden to enter into a contract with Elmstead tree and shrub for 18,620 for tree removal and pruning as described in the memo and as described by Tiger. Second. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Tiger. Thank you. That brings us to the annual fee review, which we've deferred a couple of times. And in particular, um, there's a, another memo which is on your desk now because the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission had, had approved this, recommended this last week at their meeting on the Waveney House. Uh, it's now on your desk. Oh, okay. That's, that's now you. on yeah. their tables. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to make a comment, overall comment on the fee memos. Um, I think next year we're going to try to get these memos into us by October, November, so that we can look at them with more diligence in, in the budget process. Uh, budget process gets very busy in December, January for us. And um, if we're going to make any changes, we probably ought to go into budget season in early December with these memos. So um, as you see from all of the other memos, um, no recommendations uh, are for, for fee changes are being made. Um, and I also, I'm also going to uh, encourage Ian to try to standardize these formats so we can kind of uh, have an ongoing fee uh, document that we can see the history and uh, so that we don't go five years in the case of Waveney House without increasing uh, fees. Um, so I just want to mention that. And secondly, um, so the one area where we're make, making a recommendation or partially rec recommended, but it really came off of the study that we saw back in January from case study brands uh, to upgrade Waveney House and um, to justify the major capital repairs we still have to do for ADA work on the second floor, et cetera. And um, we haven't increased the Waveney House fees. Actually, John, do you want to come to the table? Tiger's already there because T Tiger can address the capital projects, which you know, you're aware of. But um, so the idea is, you know, we probably should be increasing fees every two or three years at least and not waiting five years. Um, is John there? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Yep. Okay. So John, you want to describe what, what was recommended to Parks and Rec? And I watched the, me the meeting last night. And, okay. Uh, but I, why don't you describe to Nick and, and Kathleen what uh, Parks and Rec considered and recommended? Right. Well, first of all, as you said, through the case study brands, raising the fees up some, they, they've been substantially low for a number of years. And we don't think that many people go pick Waveney House because of their fee. They pick it more because that's where they want to have their event. Um, so with that said, Park and Rec made some minor changes. B, was, B found what Steve was, what he was going to be proposing. Um, and it's very close to these numbers, just little small changes there. Um, but mainly it's more in keeping with some of the other places that have a similar venue in town around here. So, um, 
you, could you just walk us through the uh, so that we're we're making a jump this making a, yeah making almost you're almost doubling a lot of the numbers so um on your sheet you can see the current pricing in the left hand column and then the proposed pricing there is still different days of the week and different times of the year when it's when it's most popular so but most of them go up almost almost double so and that's uh, largely because that's largely because of five years before we since we've increased fees and but also you know we've already made I, i'd add up two million dollars for a roof and another million and a half to the first floor ada compliance and we're, you know we we're making major capital investments in way any house to, to maintain the 105 year old building so well and also care the conservancy you know outdoors yeah, the conservancy plus the fact you know we are also um, so we're looking to upgrade the wedding experience as as the case study brands recommended. You know we we um, we we need to try to get it perceptively out of the rec department and more of a wave any house wedding venue experience. Yes, and that could involve you know a website that sells it more. We do nothing to market wave any house, and yet we still have consistent demand for weddings, 50, 60 weddings a year. And um, so we're, we're looking to upgrade the experience and that also may, make sure that the house is always in top not condition. That's why we've hired the part-time gardener to, to help around uh, making sure the, the grounds are always maintained throughout the season. And um, so the whole point is to upgrade the experience. So when people have a wedding, they're proud of uh, the, the experience and pleased with the experience. And we should be able to probably double our, our revenues, um, which significantly will offset the cost of these capital improvements. The bond bond payments will make over 20 years to keep the house uh, tip top shape. So, but but to be clear, these increases, John, are with respect to you know Waveney House as it is today in comparison to competition, correct? If you will, and and we and we've been underpricing Waveney for. For years. Before, yeah, and right. as improvements are made, right. I definitely see more increases coming. But right. you know, it's mm -hmm. not a matter of you know you can't instantly go to your top level rate. I right. think you'd start pushing people right. away. So, so would you say that this is sort of in the median <clears throat> range of uh, comparable wedding venues? Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And what? Just can you remind us what is the overall? revenue then in total would we expect from i can't tell weddings so I, 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 I can many, get back to you but I, okay. I really how many just, weddings uh, do we it's like there's like 50 have? weddings i believe a year 50 a, a yeah. year you okay. know some weekends there'll be three all back yeah booked up together okay. yeah we have all that information if tucker was here you know we, we did all that study yeah together with the case study brand we had a team of uh alan smith and um Christine Sullivan from the SBA. We so we modeled um, a, a future business plan with with imp improved facilities, improved condition of facilities. And so, so again, I think you know I, I would ballpark. Right now, we have one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year, and we ought to be try, trying to go to three hundred thousand dollars a year plus for, for wedding re uh, revenues. Um, we probably will. We'll probably there may be. And by the way, these will, will be effective for you know, people book weddings out as far as two years, I guess, so that uh, people who already have booked their weddings for 22 and 23 will pay the rates they were contracted for, but these will go into effect as soon as we approve them for, I guess, April 1st. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then uh, as we upgrade the experience further, um, maybe perhaps two years from now, we'll look to get to a market rate um, for a comparable first class uh, venue. If you look at some of the other venues, I mean, they're, they're, Waving House is inherently beautiful. It has to be absolutely beautiful and in, in great shape at all times for, for weddings, for people who want to pay a considerable amount of money for it, so. Yeah. I had one other question. I, as I seem to recall, was there ever a restriction or maybe there still is a restriction on the outdoor terrace in terms of having a tent or? Yes, some, part, part some... of the problem is there, there's been one wedding that came up that they wanted a tent right. and it's, happened to see the one we had up you know a short time ago um part of the issue is the turnover time you know you it might get to the point where yes you can allow tents on the terrace but you're going to have to book the place for three days worth 
the mm. day to put it up and the day to take it down because trying to take a tent down on the same day you're setting up for another wedding is, is pretty much impossible guaranteeing it so that's part of the issue so right now no tents. prohibited right yeah okay but, did, but we're looking into it seeing okay. how we can make it work okay great thank you I just had one other question, Kevin. I, I thought there was a change on the, um, was it for the uh, planning and zoning? There was a change to the, the way um, residential new construction um, is looked at is, and they're doing it by size. Yeah, there's, that well, there's two, there's actually two in land use, there's two changes. So the building department was proposing a change in valuation, right? which the, the chief building official um, Brian's ill today, so he couldn't make it, but the, uh, where, whereby he can change the valuation and that, that he's proposing to do that. So that would, that there's a slight change there, but he has that based upon the residential building code, the final building permit valuation shall be set by the building official, but he's asking for it to be formalized here. And then you're correct. Lynn is on the call. She has a proposed change, um, due to a new state law that went into effect um, to try to do exactly that. Yeah. Um, normalize it between residential and commercial construction, whereby if you have a smaller home being built, it costs you X amount of dollars, but it costs it. But if you're having a larger home being built, it costs us a lot more money to try to go in and, and um, um, perform the permit and the inspections. And that's similar to what it'd be on a, on a commercial side, right? So mm -hmm. trying to um, bring those values uh, side by side. So I don't know, Lynn, I don't know if you have anything to add. She's still on the call. The, um, that's basically it. Makes sense. And Lynn is on. Hey, I'm sorry, I just, I just missed what you said because I was actually helping someone. So uh, could you just was, repeat what you asked me? We're basically asking for that change um, now for the residential new construction to try to tie it in line with the commercial based upon size. So those, those changes that you made for anything under um, a size, certain size house to an oversized house. So, yeah, so um, last year in the state legislature, they passed um, the PA Public Act 21-29, which um, essentially uh, re required that we can't charge a different fee for um, residential buildings. We have to treat all residential buildings the same, like we can't treat multifamily different than single family. So we aligned our residential fees with how we charge our commercial fees and we did it by square feet. So all residential structures, no matter what their size, um, if it's a 1500 two family house or a 1500 one family house, it's gonna um, pay the same fee. It's all based on square footage. So we just aligned it with the commercial, the structure we already had in place for commercial um, permits. So the red, the red ink in, in your memo is the change. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not clear exactly where Brian's change is, uh, Tiger. Brian's change is more um, valuation. Right, valuation. valuation, right? So if you had a, currently, if you had a, a thousand square foot addition being installed the at $150 a square foot, it's $150,000 valuation. Brian's proposing that that valuation be increased to $175 a square foot. So the valuation would go up. At that point in time, if you look at from, it, it shaped <laughs> up where that thousand square foot um, addition right now would have a total permit fee of $1,565 with the increased valuation. While it increases the overall valuation, the permit fee only goes up slightly to $1,815 or approximately about $250. So you're looking at um, that change across the board. And uh, he hasn't done this in quite some time. So that the feeling is that he wants to try to stay exactly what is actually out there as far as how much it's costing to build. So therefore you increase your valuation based upon how much it's costing to build. And then that's reflected back into your permit fee. Okay, so the, the two land use fees, we will approve the in increases. And, um, and, and then the, the waiving house fees is as recommended by Parks and Recreation if we were other than that, as I said, next year, we, you know, these memos are dated February and stuff um, well beyond the point where we could have made changes for budget purposes. Um, so we haven't, I, not that these uh, fees are significant budget items, but next year by October, November, I'd like to have the fee memo so we can see whether we ought to make changes 
for budget purposes, especially if we have an increased fees in some areas by two or three years. That being said, all I'm saying is, um, so I would move that we um, approve the land use fees as described for the building department and the planning and zoning, and also the baby house fees as John had described, and we'll put in the minutes the appropriate uh, language as to what we've approved here. Second error. <clears throat> Further discussion? Hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Thank John you. and Lynn and Tiger. All right. Thank you. With that, we turn to tax overpayments. Any questions about the tax overpayments? None. Totaling, None. totaling uh, 32183 for motor vehicles and real estate. Um, do we move? Do we approve these? Yes. Yes. I move we approve the tax overpayments on our tablets. Second. Second. Kathleen seconds. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Contracts on our tablets. Any questions about those? Just a, just a quick one, actually, for Tiger, if you have a second. I just, I'm sorry, on, on the removal of fencing and posts in the Waveney Park Trail, can you just, where is that located? And are they, is it going to be replaced? It's no, okay. the, uh, this is actually a, a legacy fence that was installed back prior to us owning the property. And it's the, along the Merritt Parkway, there's a fence line that's been there for 60 plus years. Um, every storm a tree falls on it, knocks it down, it's rusted, it's, um, and it's unsightly. So the conservancy is looking at doing something for sound and sight mitigation through that area. Um, and we're trying to determine whether or not install a berm plant, what right. have you. So our feeling was, let's see exactly how much money it would cost us just to remove the fence and, and, and visually, you know, enhance the area, right? So remove the fence, remove some of the, some of the downed brush in the area. So we hired Joe Hussey for two days, sort of as a pilot program to see exactly how far he could get. So he's starting at the entrance to the Waveney trail system off of Lapham road, right by the bridge. Mm -hmm. And he's heading basically eastward from there up and over um, and then see exactly what he can do in two days worth of work. And at that point in time, we'll go back to the conservancy and see if they want to partner with us and continue that process and thereby removing the fence line. We are pretty much the only property along the merit that I have seen um, that has a fence that doesn't have a pool. Okay, the majority of people who are have a pool have a fence and that's the reason why they have the fence. Other Is than it that, chain it's link? Like, it's chain it, link. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah the, that's uh, what I thought. Right. Yeah. From what I understand, the, the original owner of the Laphams put it up because people were starting to park on the parkway and then walking into Waveney proper, utilizing his <laughs> land. He said, you know, no. So he put a fence up to, to delineate and the fence over time, you know, it's very difficult to maintain and every storm, a tree falls on some section and knocks it down. So we're, we're taking, we're, we're moving similar to what we did back on South Avenue 2006, seven, we took down that entire fence line along South Avenue. Some people don't even remember that there was a fence line there. We took down that and there was an instant, you know, uh, kudos for that where people said, well, the sight line is much nicer now without that fence. Mm -hmm. So the exact same thing. Here. So a berm is under consideration? There, it, a that berm is like under consideration, yeah. Uh, or planting uh, either on our side of the line or on the, on the uh, Merritt Parkway side of the line. We're trying to set up a meeting between the Waveney Park Conservancy and the Merritt Parkway Conservancy to determine whether or not there's some synergy there so between the two. Is the Merritt Park Conservancy the owner of that property, or no, no, we we own ours, and then the and then the state the state owns, owns theirs, it, right? But the the conservancy has a has a, a extreme vested interest in what how it appears. So we'd like to meet with we're trying to meet with the, the Merritt Parkway Conservancy to see if there's like I said a synergy between the two, and can we plant and on the Merritt Parkway side, on the state right of way side, it's much easier to plant on that side right. than it is on ours. Um, plant on that side and then get the sound mitigation, the site mitigation for both sides, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the Merritt Parkway gets a nice better view of more trees and then we don't necessarily look at the traffic on the parkway. So how much how much authority does the Merritt Parkway consider? Yeah, they're, they're an advisory group right. solely, but, but, they, the, but the DOT for other projects has said you need to go and get 
approval by the right. conservancy or you know at least acceptance by the conservancy so we're starting with the conservancy first before we go to the dot and then have a united front going to the dot saying this is what we would like to accomplish and can we accomplish it on your property where can we accomplish it easier and less you know less costly our side we have to build a berm in order to plant their side already has a berm we could necessarily plant it on the top of the ridge line on the top of the slope there and and <clears throat> The tree necessarily wouldn't, if it fell, wouldn't affect the parkway since they've been removing a lot of trees along that area, but it would still satisfy both situations, the sound and the site mitigation for both properties, you know, for both both sides of that, that property line. Thank you. So that's it. It's just really a test case to come in and Perfect. take out some, see exactly what it looks like, see how much we can get accomplished in two days, mm -hmm. and then and then go from there. Great. So, but if you, I, I would suggest you, I walked it yesterday, looks there's a market improvement from the one to the other and we'll take pictures and then show you exactly yeah. before and after so you can see exactly what what type of work it entailed great all right thank you thank you thank you tiger thank you and nothing further on contracts nothing. uh legal fees it's on our tablets you see the adjustment for the 220 ohm capital costs have been taken out um, that brings us to selectman comments, and I really don't have uh, much to comment. I would note that um, we continue to do our three-day week PCR testing, uh, and the health department has rapid tests for COVID, and um, Jen continues to work on vaccination clinics and booster clinics as, as needed. There's, ru there's rumors of a fourth or a, 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 I guess you call it a second booster, a fourth shot coming possibly. So, uh, and I would note that I um, unfortunately succumbed to COVID last week while I was on vacation and I'm at the tail end of my uh, uh, getting over that as, as well as my wife. So anyway, um, vaccinations work in my view, so. I encourage people to get their vaccinations and get their booster shots. Other than that, I have no further comments, I think. Really sorry to hear that. Um, and I hope you're feeling better, both of you. But actually, can you just go back and make a motion to approve the uh, legal fees? Thank, thank you. Well, do we, I, I, I guess, what did I do there? Motion to approve the legal fees. I move we approve the legal fees on our tablets. And I'll second. Second, Kathleen, seconds for the discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's always important to pay your lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, any comments? I just had one on the um, Divine Cottage in Tiger. I'm sorry. We About, I guess, two meetings ago, we'd asked for bids, and you said you're going to come back to us with uh, bids for painting the Vine Cottage. I know this has been something I've been asking for for quite some time. Where do we stand on that? Been around to bid now. We haven't received bids back yet. When do we <laughs> expect them? Very shortly. Next meeting? Hopefully, yes. OK, yeah. great. Thank you. Looking forward to that. I just, I just don't remember the bid date off the top of my head, but it's, it'll be within that time frame. OK. Thank you. Anything yeah. further? Nothing on my end. I move we adjourn at 9.25. Uh, and by the way, Pam, we didn't get any comments from the public by email, I gather. So move we adjourn at 9.25 a.m. Second here. All right. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Feel better. Feel better. <laughs>